69. We are only 69 Patreon supporters away from hitting our first goal. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. For less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you can help support the show. We are only 69 Patreon subscribers away from hitting our goal, which will allow this channel to continue to grow and prosper so we can bring you the best content possible. For more information, check the link down below and join us on Patreon. I would really appreciate your support. Thank you. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Two, one, and we are recording. How is it they didn't feel the bite? Like, just finish that story off, because that's a pretty cool story. Um, well, for one, uh, he's new. Um, him and his son booked a trip. Um, they're new clients. I had uh, I had not fished with them before. Um and, you know, they, they were still getting by mid, mid, midway through the day, they were fairly comfortable with the equipment. You know, we use pretty good size bait casting reels and, and rods. Um, you know, the, the rods are almost like broomsticks. So, um, you know, like I said, we, I mean, a, a lot of the musky trips we've had, I mean, no exaggeration. We've, we've counted up to 13 follows and, you know, the fish are, it's mainly those female fish. They're, they're just not ravenous yet, even though the water temperature is, you know, uh, we're, we're good now uh, to fish for muskie. The colder it gets, you know, the, the more ravenous they're going to get and they're going to crash the baits instead of this, you know, uh, you know, it's more of an exploratory, you know, what is that? So in this case, uh, his name, his name's Mark. Um, you know, we were pretty close to the end of the float and, and, uh, and I had, we had caught a big fish in that very spot and literally- wow. I was telling him the story and I saw his line move and I'm like, Mark, you, you got to set the hook, man. That's a fish. And, um, he's like, man, I don't feel anything. And sure enough, the fish starts swimming up upstream parallel to the boat. I'm like, man, set the hook. And, and he did. And it came out. So it, it just wasn't a, a solid bite, but this weekend, um, you know, we're, we were expecting a significant weather change. Um, I'm out for smallmouth tomorrow. And then I've got a pretty long run of musky trips going next week. I think it's going to be pretty good. It, it never ceases to amaze me that whether you're dealing with a, a trophy size, large mouth, small mouth, or a musky, how a fish that big can take a bait so subtly. It's just always mm -hmm. so cool to me. E even though I've been in this sport for my whole life, it never ceases to yep. amaze me how that happens. Well, and, and I tell a lot of my clients um, a, 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 on most of the, biggest smallmouth I've ever caught, I I either didn't feel them at all and I saw the line move, or you know, it was just a, you know, in, in the in the case of, you know, we're using plastic bait and sometimes even with a crankbait. But you know, those big fish, those big smallmouth, you know, basically they just they just open their gills and they just inhale that water in. Whereas, you know, smaller fish, they're, you know, they're trying to get mm -hmm. their mouth on the on the bait and you feel that it almost feels like a uh, BB gun is like, you know, boom, 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 yes. boom, boom, or small, where the big fish just flare their gills and, you know, they, they inhale that and you might feel a, you know, tick or you just see that line move off. That's so cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Now, last time we talked, we really got a deep dive into the, into the summertime. And now that we're basically, I, I don't even, would you consider this the fall transition? Are we in oh, fall yeah. time yet? Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're in the transition. I mean, Kind of, kind of both, really. I mean, uh, the water hasn't completely turned over yet. So I had a smallmouth trip, uh, middle, middle of the, what, what is today? Today's Friday, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I lose track of days. It was, um, it was Monday, and um, you know, the morning was more like fall. Um, you know, they were in the deeper holes. So you know, what starts to happen is these big. You know, if I'm talking smallmouth right now. The bigger smallmouth will start moving into their wintering holes you know, as this water starts to, you know, starts to drop, you know, we're probably in the mid sixties. It's probably creeped up a couple of degrees, but you know, as we get into the fifties, they're going to be moving into those, into their wintering holes. So in the morning we found that the fish were more like fall, but in the afternoon, you know, the sun came out, the fog burned off. You know, we were in short sleeve shirts when I'd started out in long, long pants, uh, a hooded, hooded sweatshirt. And the biggest fish we caught all day was actually in current and we it was a, it was a citation wow and uh 
caught it right in current, right where a float was coming between some rocks. So, you know, we're kind of in that transition. But, you know, before long here, when that water starts to get into the, like I said, gets below 60 into the high 50s, then you're kind of officially in the fall, the fall bite. Now, and that sounds like it's really for the smallmouth and the muskies. And I believe, based on our last conversation, that the trout season is starting to heat up as well. Are you still waiting for those perfect temperatures? Or are you able to go up into the Jackson and, and really get on that bite? Um, you know, I haven't been up there much. Um, my musky business has gotten so strong that I wow. really haven't. Yeah, it's musky is I've run more musky trips this year than I have smallmouth for the first time ever. So musky is dominating my my business nowadays. So I haven't been up there that much. And honestly, um, you know, the water is really low. I don't know how it is where you are, but I mean, it's low yeah. everywhere. And, and and it right now, right now. Yeah, if we had if we had good water levels, you know, and, and I had some trips booked, I would be up there. Um but it would it would be tough sledding. Um, you know, you really need. I like a water level of about 600 CFS, which is you know about three feet at the gauge, and it's running like one foot. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, I know. It's it's it, we need rain. I, I think finally next weekend we're supposed to get some. Keeping my fingers crossed. I think we're supposed to get a little bit today, but I don't think it's going to move the needle much. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, you're fine. That's what <laughs> I don't know if you heard that. I've got a, I've got three Great Pyrenees, and one of them's in the house. <laughs> You got a busy yeah, house. They're, yeah, they're huge. Yeah, she's she's coming up right behind me here. <laughs> um, with you, you mentioned the rain. I think that is fascinating because I know the Rappahannock was in a, a basically a drought advisory, and then the Shenandoah Valley. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of trout streams that were just knocked off the list until we get more water. How has that affected yep. the fish behavior? Um. Well, what what it does is well when when you're when you're this low you know, you're going to have very, very clear water. The fish get very skittish. So, you know, fish, I may have said this before, and I think a lot of people probably know this, you know, fish don't have eyelids. So they're very light sensitive. So one, you've got very clear water. And when the, when the, when the sun gets up high, the fish just, they just scatter. Um, you know, that, that, so on the flip side of that, if we've got normal water levels and, you know, if you get, you know, if you get some rain, which I, I like, you can have some stain in the water, the fish are going to be on the prowl and on the hunt a lot more. They're going to be a lot more aggressive. They're going to be a lot less skittish and spooky. Um, so, you know, consequently this year um, on my, uh, for smallmouth fishing, uh, because it's happened the last couple of years. You know, as we get in the fall, this is the second year in a row where we've been really low going into October. Uh, I switched over to braid um, with a fluorocarbon leader. And I mean, you could, I mean, you could launch a small bait, mm -hmm. 50, 60, 70 yards. That is so important because before, even especially with uh, newer clients or clients that uh, don't have, you know, don't have a ton of experience, you know, 15 yards, that's, that's not, that's not going to be enough in clear water. Now, it, you know, if we had stain, fine, you know, you probably do okay. But when we have the water like this, uh, you really need to get distance. And then the other, the, the, the one advantage um, to, you know, having the low clear water is that the fish will get really stacked up. So, uh, you know, I have a, I have an anchor, you know, I, I run a raft, I don't have a motor and I have an anchor. So, What's been happening is when we can find, you know, if we if we knock a couple fish, I'll drop the anchor and I'm like, okay, I, I I got a good idea because there's just not as much water, you know, places for them to go. Um, so the other thing about, you know, the river being low and and being clear is, and and I pretty much do this anyway, but you know, we're at the boat ramp in the dark. Um, that those first couple hours of the morning are absolutely critical. Um, because you've got low light and like, if I go down to, you know, balcony falls, uh, down in the gorge, uh, or in a lot of places, you know, you're going to have a fog effect, mm -hmm. um, you know, where the dew point, you know, is kind of matching the, the, the air temperature. So you get this really heavy fog, which, you know, it's like cloud cover. So you have to take advantage of that. Once that, once that fog burns off, usually the, the sun gets over the mountain, um, and it starts getting sunny, it, you know, you have to change your approach a little bit. Whereas, you know, they're going to be up under the ledges. They're going to be 
uh, on, you know, shady overhang, you know, banks, undercut banks and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, it, it definitely changes the fish behavior. Um, uh, but you know, at least for where I fish, the bite for smallmouth, the bite has remained really good. We're out, we've been averaging about 40 fish a trip. Wow. Um, we've been putting citations in the boat the last, uh, I don't know, handful of trips. Um, but we have, you know, we're not into the, the real giants yet. That's probably going to start coming in the next week or so. You know, that, they, that, that water's got to get cold because musky and smallmouth, basically the same trout, you know, they, they start feeding very heavily for two reasons. One is they want to try to maintain the metabolism that they've had all summer. So they just eat more so they can stay more active. And, you know, they're starting to store up fat for the winter time. So, um, you know, they just, once, once that water starts getting cold, and the weather gets cold, they just get ravenous. And that's, that's when it's really fun. You, the, the quantity of fish goes down, but the quality of fish goes up. How does, we had an L, we, we had a hurricane a couple weeks ago that came into the area, yep. really dropped some rain. We're getting more rain next week. When you have that big drop of rain and it changes the current flow, it, it, it really changes the water complexion, the color. Yep. Is there a couple of day law before the fish get conditioned to it and the bite turns on? Or is it basically instantaneous? Do you, does it affect your guiding when you get that heavy rain? Well, it, 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 it depends on how the rain comes. So we had that same, we had the same remnants, although we didn't get, I mean, we got a good, steady, long rain, which was great, but it, it, it might've moved the river about five inches. Um, it, when, it, when it rains, it, it, you have to really look at two things. Did it come hard and fast? Like, was it an absolute downpour, you know, and all of a sudden the creeks and the springs and, you know, and it, it, it muddies up the water in that case, in that scenario that you were, you, you kind of mentioned it, it's going to take a couple of days because yeah, the fish are going to get, they're going to get, uh, you know, they're going to kind of run up into the mouths of creeks. They're going to kind of spread out to the banks. They're going to get out of the main flow. So yeah, it's going to take a couple of days for that to settle down. On the flip side of that, the situation that I was mentioning that if you get a nice steady rain and, and you start to get a, 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 a rising river, man, that can be absolute lightning in a bottle because when you come from low water and you start that water level starts coming up. And I've probably said this before. It's in the nature of all fish to chase, mm -hmm. especially smallmouth. I mean, that they, they're just like a cat. And, you know, so you take a, you know, you, you take a piece of yarn and you, you know, you drag it across your carpet, you know, they, they get down and they, they stare at it and they look at it. But if you do that, they can't help themselves. Kind of like, that's kind of the way it is with, with, uh, with the rising river and that everything starts to move, you know, the, the bait starts to move, the, the ecosystem moves and it, it turns them on and it, it's going to turn on trout and musky too. Um, so you know, it depends on how much of a rise you have. If it rises up to the point where, uh, obviously, you want to be careful, you know, that it doesn't get unsafe. But if it gets up to a level where it starts to, you know, get muddy, then you want to back off. Because, you know, I mean, you can still catch fish in muddy water, um, but it can it can be tough. But stained water can be fantastic. I mean, that I, that's what I prefer. You know, it's that kind of a dark greenish color. Mm -hmm that the water gets, <clears throat> but then on the other side, so let's say the water crests up, it gets muddy, it's muddy for a few days, and then it starts to turn down the other side. And then you get back into that, that dark green. That's a that's go for it. That's, that's money. I mean, I, I live for those days. <laughs> I pray for them. What's crazy is right now here up on the Shenandoah and the upper Potomac river uh, near Hancock, there is so much subaquatic vegetation. We had so much grass this year. And yep. now you're starting to see the yeah, you're starting to see the die off. And so yep. how the hell do you fish your clients through this stuff when it's just it looks like somebody went through there with a lawnmower? Yeah, well, that's that's a good question. So, you know, one of the areas that we see a lot of that stuff is when you have an eddy. So that that grass and that algae will, you know, will get picked up by the current and then will get taken over into an eddy. And, it, you know, you'll throw over there and, you know, you just bring in a salad. So you just kind of have to avoid some of those areas and find areas where, you know, there's still some current or, you know, you can, you can, 
you know, if you've got good polarized glasses, you can't see it all. You obviously, you know, if you're in deep water, you can't see the bottom. But uh, a lot of cases with, you know, I have pretty good polarized glasses. I can I can kind of see and kind of uh, uh, direct the clients, you know, where the best place is for them to throw. But if you can get, you know, close to current or on a current scene, it's not likely that you're probably going to get that grass and that algae. You're going to find it a lot of times in your slack water and especially where you have a, a back eddy where you get all that foam you know, that starts to pile up. There's one place I know in particular when you talk when you're talking about it, that's immediately what I think of. And it's a really good place to fish. But here lately, we've gone in there and cast a couple of times like, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a waste of time right now. What what kind of are you limited in your bait selection right now when it comes to muskie or or smallmouth because of all the grass that's starting to uproot and float down river? Uh, not really. No, I mean, you know, the the here lately, um, as, as you move into the as you move into this transition in fall, it, there's, there's smallmouth are, are, are really they chase a lot of uh, forage minnows. I mean. They're still going to eat uh, crawdads, but we have caught less fish on the Ned rigs and the bottom plastic baits and more on crankbaits. I mean, 90% of our, our, our selection has been on crankbaits, square bill, running three to five feet, anything that still looks like a crawdad pattern, you know, uh, brown, yellow, orange, uh, olive green, you know, those are the colors. Uh, I've got about three or four crankbaits that are my go-to no reason really to do anything else and now a jerkbait is really good right now too and as this water gets colder we start to size our baits up because the forage that is still remaining that has survived the summer and that have survived predators um has started to get really big so you can you should throw bigger baits in the fall um but in terms of limitation not really i mean you know i've talked at least a couple times when I've been with you that our muskie selection almost a hundred percent, you know, my, my buddy, uh, Dennis Perko and Perko lures, uh, his swim baits. I mean, we're still catching them on those baits. They, uh, the, the, the hard bait that's called the prime suspect that probably our number one, he's got four different styles of baits. Uh, it's got a long curly tail on it. It can't look any more like, you know, the suckers and the fall fish in the river and mm. the fish just, they just can't, they just can't, they just can't resist it. And then he's got, you know, a couple glide baits that, you know, do really well. The only thing about the glide baits and they do really good, but a glide bait is not real conducive for the figure eight. It just gets kind of wonky when you stick it down in the water and you're, but, but the hard bait does great. And then he's got a one called uh, the grid search. That's a multi-segmented bait. You know, and it kind of snakes through the water and looks alive. That that's been a really good pattern. All of them do great, but the the grid search and the prime suspector seems to be seems to be our two best. But to answer your question directly, not really changing what we're throwing. We're not throwing a lot of plastics. One because not really chasing plastics a lot, but they are they are bringing up a lot of stuff right now until that gets washed out and then guys link in the episode description uh to the bait shop so you can go check out his stuff it's really really cool especially the the swim baits are really cool um you mentioned i think this is very important because i think people overlook this detail when you say that you size up we need context to make sure people don't go out there and buy a, a 12 inch huddleston for a small mouth when you're going from the fall transition to the fall and you say you're sizing up is it going from like a two inches to three inches on your bait size like what does that entail yeah, so a lot of the crankbaits we throw, uh, you know, like in the summertime, uh, spring, you know, you know, probably, you know, and you don't count the bill. The finesse But, style. you know, probably, yeah, you probably, you know, two and a half, two and a quarter. But now now we're up to, you know, three and a half mm. uh, for a crankbait for a smallmouth. Um, the jerkbaits, uh, one of my favorite jerkbaits is the, uh, the Rapala Ripstop, uh, which is the 09 version, uh, which is... I don't know how many inches that is. Five? Yeah, about five. Probably about five inches right there. You know, we're going up to like a seven inch to an eight inch jerk bait. Wow. You know, yeah, pr pretty good size. And those are actually custom. A uh, gentleman from my hometown named Matt Good. Um, he makes uh, some custom baits. He made me a bunch of uh, uh, custom. They they look, they, they don't look as much as like the ripstop as they do um, 
gosh, I always forget lucky craft. They kind of look like the lucky craft with that hump on the back. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So I haven't thrown those a lot yet because it's, it's just been too warm, but probably in the next week, we're going to start throwing those real heavy. We're going to start throwing those, uh, heavier, uh, those bigger crankbaits. And then on the musky side, uh, the prime suspect that I talk about a lot, um, I think it's seven and a half to eight inches. Um, you know, we'll start, we'll start gradually going up on that very same bait, uh, to a 10 inch, a 12. And now he even has a 16 Damn. and this, yeah, it's, 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 it's massive. Now that's probably more reserved for winter, you know, and pre-spawn, you know, there's, you know, you're talking about a bait that's, you know, you know, that long. Um, so, but yeah, we're definitely going to start doing those 10 and 12s here very soon. They still seem to be pretty interested. And, and we kind of did an experiment the other day, me and Dennis, did, when we're out on a scout trip. And we overall, we had 13 follows. We put uh, one fish in the boat. We had another one hooked that got off right at the, right in front of the, right by the net. But I had probably 80 to 85% of the follows. He had a handful of follows. So they're just not real interested in that giant bait yet. But, but, it, but it's coming soon. What what positions? Uh, not to give away the juice, but are are you are you targeting more of the upper James proper below Lynchburg? Are you trying to stay near the Jackson, the cow pasture? Do different parts of the river turn on at different times in the fall? I'm just thinking with the cool temperatures and where we're at. Well, the Jackson is always going to run um, even after the paper plant, which you know, uh, up above the paper plant is all trout water, yeah. and that's definitely colder. Um, below the paper plant, even down through Clifton Forge and, and it's set to the confluence of the James, uh, is always going to be five to 10 degrees colder than uh, the James. So we can actually, typically, we can actually start fishing there a little sooner than we're able to fish it on the James, um, just, you know, because of the water temperature. Eventually, it, it'll even out a little bit here in the fall. Um, but uh, a lot of a lot of my musky fishing, I, I focus uh, in the area where I live, Eagle Rock. Um, so, uh, from, from Clifton Forge all the way down to Eagle Rock and even down to, uh, say Horseshoe Bend, uh, you know, down below my house, um, which is about halfway from here to Buchanan. And then I, I do some down, uh, in the natural bridge area. Um, and that's, you know, small mouth and musky. And then, you know, I love balcony falls and in the Mari river, I haven't been able to get on since, uh, gosh, second week in June or July rather, because it's, it's running at like one foot and I need three and I need three foot. So it's two feet below where it should be. I mean, I could probably get on the Mari with just one person in the boat besides myself at two and a half. But yeah, I, I, this is the second year in a row that I haven't, now I'm hoping that changes mm -hmm. because the Mari is just, you know, phenomenal. It's just been, it's been hard. I mean, I know there's a couple of guides yeah. on the, the Shenandoah river, same thing. Like they can't fish the the north fork of the shenandoah because it's just it's too freaking low and you know i guess this is seasonal this has happened before but when you look at pictures of example like the rappahannock some people have been posting pictures where it looks like it's bone dry it's like holy crap yeah. this is insane rock, rock gardens yeah yeah it's, it's rock gardens and I, I just don't know what that i think that's one reason we probably have so much grass this year versus the, in years prior I, and i absolutely is I, hopefully this helps like the bluegill population out or something because I, <laughs> I i've seen a lot more bluegill this year than I had in the past, which I think is a good thing, especially because we have a, we have a flathead issue on the upper Potomac right now. So they need same here, man. Same here on the James. Is it, have, have, has it gotten any worse since we talked last? I mean, have you seen the uptick or anything like that? Or is it the same old, same old? Yeah, I would say it's probably the same old, same old. Yeah. I, no better, no worse. Yeah. I mean, that, that's a good thing to hear. Uh, one thing is we're getting in and it sounds like, you know, musky is bread and butter for people that are listening. What is the primary musky season? I was always told, you know, it's really November, December, January, those colder months, but you're saying you're seeing an uptick now. Are we just, are we just starting to get into, into the good season for musky? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's more than one season. Uh, you kind of have to break it down into a couple different components and, you know, it's kind of, you know, what you're looking for too. So, Fall is just my favorite time, you know, and, and one of the reasons I like fall so much is the weather is a little more predictable than it is in the winter and the spring. Um, you know, you can, you know, I, I, I might've talked to you about this a while back, but I had a trip back in, it was a smallmouth trip. I had a smallmouth trip back in uh, April. It was uh, good Friday. 
The day before Good Friday, it was 85 degrees. The day I fished, it was 45. And when we ate lunch, we had sleep bouncing off the raft. <laughs> so uh, fall is more stable. And, you know, you can you can start out in a lot of days in a hooded sweatshirt, long pants. And, you know, by afternoon, you can probably have a T-shirt on. You know, it just depends. Um, so, you know, some, some people like uh, and clients like you know, the, the ability to come out with the comfort of, you know, not being, you know, absolutely frozen. Some people just don't like that cold weather, you know, really cold weather. And that, and you know, to your point, musk, musky can be good all the way through the winter time. But one of the reasons that, you know, as I mentioned, I like fall so much is because you got that, you know, you got the weather that's getting nice. The water temperatures are dropping. The fish are starting to get active and, and you have a lot of, uh, you know, the foliage, you know, a lot of people come as much for that as they as they do the fishing, you know, the, the beautiful scenery. But so if I were to break it down, you know, you've got, you know, the fall season, which is, you know, will lead lead us into wintertime. And, you know, the fish, you know, we really look forward to that water temperature getting below 70. It's like you're just waiting all summer. Like I can't wait until, you know, when that water gets below 70. So we get out and musky fish again because, you know, it's been two, three, however many months since we've been able to fish for them. So that's a really exciting time and people get, you know, really amped up for that. Like, okay, it's time to go again. And, you know, and, and as I mentioned before, you know, it's going to get a little colder and, you know, right through, I, I really love this time right up to Thanksgiving or right up to the first of December. I'll continue to fish. I don't particularly like to be out there in, in December and January, but you know, you can catch some fish. I don't, I'm not as busy during that time. And then, and then we swing around, and as we get into February, then you have the pre-spawn season. Mm -hmm. And that's a great time because you can get some pretty nice days in February, um, you know, upper 40s, 50s. And wintertime and, and, and pre-spawn is, is the time that you can catch, really, the fish of a lifetime. And you can during this time now, too. But you know how pre-spawn is for any species. I mean, they're going to feed really heavy because they know, you know, after they spawn – they drop their eggs. They're, you know, they're going to have a period where there's relative little to no activity. So, so for me, it's you know fall, fall, early winter, uh, pre-spawn, which is February and March, and then a lot of people like that post-spawn because the fish are very opportunistic. You know, the fish come back the first of May after being down the whole month of April, basically, and you know we size down. Because the water's, you know, a little warmer, but we're still under. And man, I mean, that's a lot of, that's when a lot of non-musky fishermen accidentally catch the musky just because they're so opportunistic because just about anything that comes in their direction. Mm. So it's, it's, it's never easy, but it's certainly easier to catch fish during that time period in May and June, probably than any other time. So I kind of break it down into three seasons. That makes so much sense because I, I again, when you think May, it's also when when bass tournaments and kayak tournaments really start to heat up, and the smallmouth bite heats up for a lot of people, and then all of a sudden they're catching muskies bycatch, and then they start right. complaining that the muskie are a problem, and it just it's <laughs> it's interesting how all this kind of coincides because I remember growing up as a kid, sadly that uh, smallmouth anglers hated muskie. They thought they were the culprit for every evil in the world until I guess flathead showed up and <laughs> now they got something yeah. new to be upset about. Um, yeah. Is that stigma gone now? Are, are, are anglers more accepting of the muskie as just part of the ecosystem? Is it, is it the same kind of, uh, drama as it was 10 years ago? I don't think it's as, is bad, but I'll give you an example. I, um, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a fresh, uh, there's a farm nearby that that slaughters their own cows, and and I went and got some, you know, giant uh, dog bones <laughs> for my for my Pyrenees because I've got one Pyrenees that's almost 200 pounds. He's yeah, he's just massive. So anyway, uh, this is the first time I had met the guy. I've been and we're gonna get some other stuff from him. But uh, I pulled up and he saw my vehicle and he said, oh, "So you do the smallmouth and the musky and the um, and trout?" He said. He said, man, he said, I went smallmouth fishing not long ago and, and, you know, didn't catch many. He said, you know, those damn musky have ruined the smallmouth fishing. And so it's still prevalent. And then I, I kind of took some time to try to reeducate him on what's actually happening. Now, have, have smallmouth or have musky eaten some of the smallmouth? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But you know what? 
big mus big smallmouth eat small musky. <laughs> so you know, smallmouth are pretty ravenous too. But I think um, what the what the Department of Natural Resources has done, Virginia Tech, I think, you know, they did a study a while back. Uh, you know, they they've they've uh, you know they've posted some of the results online. I don't think it's nearly as bad as it used to be, but I think maybe the casual fisherman observer might still have that kind of thought process in their head process in their head that the, the musky have, you know, have ravaged the smallmouth population. And that's not that's not really true. It is the flatheads. It, no, it, it really is. I mean, when you have a predator like a muskie, which is it, it's so territorial, there's always so few in an ecosystem compared to a flathead. It's absolutely it's insane. But again, it, it's just educating the public. Um, and with, with education in mind, if somebody wants to book a trip with you, what would you like them to bring in a perfect world if they were going to bring anything? Yep. Well, appropriate dress and attire. Uh, they need, a, they need just to bring a lunch. I provide drinks and snacks. They don't need to bring any, any tackle. I provide tackle for every species. I have some folks that like to bring their own stuff and that's fine, you know? Uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to that if they want to if they want to do that. They need to have a valid Virginia fishing license, either resident or non-resident. Um, you know, typical things like, you know, polarized sunglasses are very important. Mm, um, that's good. One. You know, what, you know, you don't need to go out and spend two hundred fifty dollars. You can get a nice pair for 20 or somewhere in that range. But it will really help you read the water, especially when the water is clear. And even when the water has some stain, you can still get some, you know, four to six feet of visibility. But it really helps you read like the ledges and the pockets between the ledges. You know, you'll, you know, a lot of places where we fish, you know, we have these huge rock ledges. And, you know, you got that dark seam that of water that runs in between them. And sometimes you can't see that, especially if there's a ripple on the water and, you know, a glare from the sun. You may not see that, but with polarized sunglasses, you can see it. I think it's always a good idea to have a hat, you know, to kind of break the break the sunlight overhead. Uh, suntan lotion, you know, I, I, I mean, as a guide, that's critical. I, I'm not one of those guides that are dressed head to toe and, you know, with the buff and everything, and all you can see is my eyes. I can't do that. I'm very hot natured, so I like to be in shorts. I like to be in a t-shirt, but I always coat, you know, because I, I think that's so important. I, I've heard many times that num number one cause of death amongst fishing guides is, sun, is skin cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to be very wary of that. Um, I always bring rain gear. Um, That's a good one too. Uh, down at Balcony Falls, I've said this so many times, down in the gorge, it has like its own weather system down there. Um, the, the, the wind gets funneled down through the gorge and sometimes it'll rain down there and be windy and it's not raining or windy anywhere else. It's it's almost like the rainforest or something. It's really weird. I mean, it's not like it rains down there all the time. It doesn't. But I'm just saying, I I have been so glad a number of occasions when, you know, the, the rain chances were like below 10 percent. And you know what? It ended up raining. <laughs> and I was and I was prepared for that. So I always bring rain gear. Um, footwear uh, is important. Um, you know, I don't require my clients to get out of the boat, um, you know, but sometimes in low water, you know, I, I get. I get stuck on rocks and I may need a little help, you know, just to maybe stick a foot out, you know, the side of the boat. Uh, as much as I hate to say it, it, sometimes it depends on, you know, the size of the people that I have to, uh, you know, I don't discriminate at all, you know, not, not whatsoever, but it can be, you know, it can be a challenge sometimes, especially in low water. So sometimes it's a good idea to have some type of uh, footwear that's, you know, like, uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to plug Orvis by any means, but I, I have these Orvis shoes called uh, Pro Approach, hmm. um, and they're really cool. They've <laughs> they've got a, a Michelin a Michelin gosh Michelin logo on the bottom, so it's Michelin rubber. Oh, that's cool. And and they're built for wading, and they've got neoprene that come up over your ankles um, that keep all the you know the 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 the, you know, the small sand the crap out the of small them. rocks. Yeah. Yeah. And I love wearing those shoes. Um, and then eventually, you know, I'll wear wading boots, you know, and when, you know, and when the weather turns cold, you know, it's not necessary that clients wear waders, but it's always helpful because waders will keep you warm. Mm -hmm. They'll also keep you dry. 
um, and, you know, wading boots as well. So it just kind of depends on what they want. You know, I'll always uh, communicate with clients starting seven to 10 days out saying, hey, here's what the weather's looking like. That very well can change. Just be prepared. Here's some of the things that I think that you probably ought to have or to be thinking about. I think that's so important because you deal with such a wide swath of like a 30 year veteran elite and then a dude that's taking his son out for the first time. And I really, yeah. I personally believe the times that you're going to get in trouble on rivers is that weird spring transition where it feels warm, but the water's cold. And it's also in the fall because yeah, if it's January and I go out, you know what to wear. If it's August, you know what to wear, but you don't think ahead of, like you said, you're wearing a sweatshirt in the morning and it feels like you could wear shorts in probably in sometimes in November, but that water, if you fall in, you can get hypothermia real quick. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, and I, I think I, I, I might've shared this story, uh, on one of the other podcasts, but a few years back when I was. Uh, when I was living in North Carolina and I was, I was, uh, I was uh, only part-time and I was, you know, I was even guiding on the new river, which I don't do a whole lot anymore, but um, uh, a, a boyfriend and a girlfriend from uh, uh, UNC Charlotte had, uh, I, I want to say it was fall. Um, they, he was a baseball player at UNC. Um, they had gone up to the new river and it was one of these days. It was, it was like almost, it was almost Halloween. So the water temperature was in the fifties. But we had one of these days that was like 82, 83 degrees. And they took a canoe and they had shorts and T-shirts on. And they, you know, the water was up a little bit too. And they flipped. Um, and he, unfortunately, he drowned. Uh, and she she luckily survived. But it was, you know, folks that were, you know, just recreational. Mm. Didn't know how to, didn't know to check the water gauge. Didn't know to check the water temperature. Just, it was like, hey, it's a beautiful day outside. Let's get outside. Let's enjoy the, the fall foliage, the great weather. And they just were not prepared properly. And you, to your point, you can get in trouble real fast and even lose your life if you're not if you're not paying attention. I, I, Travis Eden of Kingfisher Guide Service, he's on the Shenandoah, and he told a story like that the last time I had him on. It was it was April, and he said it was early April. It was the first like 85-degree day, and he was going down with clients, and he saw this this yellow thing upturned, and it was a kayak. And the guy was sitting there, uh, in a short and t-shirts clinging onto the side of the kayak. And when he got him, he couldn't oh, talk. He said he was shaking yeah. and it was, he said it was the first warm day. And he said that guy went out by himself to try to go fishing and he flipped. And he said like, if I didn't come around the tor the corner when I did, he'd probably be dead. And you don't think about that. If you're a novice person, just like, I'm going to go to Dick's sporting goods. I'm going to buy a kayak. It's kind of nice. I don't need to prepare. I'm only going to be out for a couple of hours. And, you know, it's right. very important on on river situations, guys. I can't harp on this enough because usually the people that are going to go out. If they don't have a jet boat or a guide, you're going to float. That's dangerous because there's n you're you're really disconnecting from society in that sense. And you might not have self-service. Let people know where you're going, when you're going to drop off, when to expect you if they don't hear a call. Like every time my wife always calls me habitually you know, halfway through the yep. day, if it's a bass boat tournament or a kayak thing, because I told her, it's like, if I don't respond, that's a problem. And it's just my mm -hmm. little safety thing. And I, th I really want to make sure I encourage that to people that want to go out, either book a guide trip with you, of course, or if you're going out on your own, be careful and bring extra clothes and layers. Yeah. One thing I'll, I'll, I'll also add that, that's, that, that they've done here in the four counties that the Jackson River and the James River as part of the upper James that they've done. Um, the the uh, so Allegheny County, Botetourt County, Rockbridge County, and Amherst County, um, the the local fire departments have required the counties to put up mile markers on the river, oh. um, and, and and up until I think this year or last year it was just at the odd mile markers, but now it's at every mile, and even at the access points, they have a posting of of exactly where you are, including the decimal. So. For instance, you could be at mile 5.7 when you're putting in. And the reason, especially with like the, the liveries, and you know, and I, I know uh, them very well. But so like, for instance, uh, there's a big one down in Buchanan called Twin River Outfitters. They, they, um, they, they go through a tutorial before they put folks out on the river. Um, and, and they're asking folks, even if they're not going through a livery, you know, to be familiar with those places because every summer, like especially between uh, behind my house, 
between access points is 13.7 miles. Mm. So these kids get out here and unfortunately, you know, they'll start, you know, having alcohol, alcohol, you'll see, you know, a cooler floating behind, you know, a, a kayak or whatever. And, and, you know, they're having a great time and all of a sudden, you know, it starts getting dark and accident or no accident, you know, they'll call 911 like, Hey, we're lost. We don't know where we are. The first thing they're going to ask them is what mile mark, what was the last mile marker you saw? Mm. So they, they can get to you quickly before that. I mean, years and years ago, somebody did some painting on, on some trees, but you know, that has faded since faded out. But I think that's a great thing, especially for these water and rescue folks that, you know, if you know the difference between just a minute or two, just like the scenario you gave with the guy in the, uh, in the kayak could mean the difference of, you know, you living or dying. I had no idea that the James River had those mile markers. That's really good information. I had, it's such a local insight that I didn't know that. And when you have people vacationing down there, that's really important to kind of know. Yeah, absolutely. Rob, again, I know you're a busy man. I can't, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, what is your schedule like right now? If somebody's listening and wants to book a trip with you, uh, musky, smallmouth yep. trout, like what do they have to do? And do you have any availabilities left? Man, I'm glad you asked that because I was going to ask. I was going to ask you if I could talk about uh, a scenario uh, in particular. I've had some weird situations with clients in the last couple of weeks where I've had some cancellations, and I posted some things on on Facebook. Uh, one of my best customers had a bike accident. Um, yeah, he's really banged up. I had another guy that's got a a rotator cuff issue. So, um, so the following dates are open in October, which normally, I mean. Like today was a chosen day that I postponed, but I moved those guys into November because we, you know, we had some hot weather this week. But the following days are open in October, which are absolutely prime dates for, you know, all three species. But, you know, smallmouth and musky are what I'm mainly doing. Um, so I think it's Wednesday, October 18th is available. Friday, October 20th. And then Sunday, October 22nd, Monday, the 23rd and Tuesday, the 24th. Those are the only five days that I have open. And like I said before, they would not have been, oh, they were, they were booked, but they're open now. So I would, you know, if somebody's interested, I would highly encourage you to contact me as soon as possible. Uh, November, I still have some good dates starting to get some, some fill in in November. Uh, but there's still several good dates. So, uh, yeah, if they want to contact me, you know, they can, you know, Reach me uh, by my phone number that's on my website. Uh, I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook just as Rob England. Um, I'm on Instagram as Appalachian Bronzeback Adventures. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think of how else. I think that's all the all the methods. Um, and, and, of course, my website. My website. And then it Appal it's app, app Bronzeback ADV com. So you can reach me any three of those ways. Uh, I, I'll expect that, you know, November is going to start filling up, you know, and it, it, it has been just in the last you know few days. I, typically people will book a lot more advanced, but, uh, me personally, and I don't know if you've heard this from other guides, uh, the economy, I think is got starting to get people really nervous. Yeah. You know, I would typically have a lot of bookings in, in the 24 already. And that's been a little softer than normal. I think it'll eventually come, but you know how things go with an election year. And I think yeah. people are being a, and, and the holidays are coming up. So I think people are being a little more cautious. So anyway, I have those five dates open in October. They're prime dates. I mean, they are right in smack dab in my favorite time. Those two weeks leading up to uh, Halloween and those two weeks after Halloween, my some of my favorite four weeks of the entire year. You know, I, I was going to end it, but that you just brought up a great question, which is how much does the economy affect you? Because I've had people joke, like, the closer you get to D.C., the more insulated you are. And the James, you're right next to Richmond and really northern Virginia. Like, in the past, has it really hurt you? It has. It has at times. It it, it seems like there's typically like a lag. So when, when COVID first hit, you know, and of course that had a, a huge impact on the economy, it was like, it was like, you know, it, it went real quiet for a while. It was kind of like, okay, people were just kind of waiting and seeing, you know, what was going to happen. But then, you know, that year actually benefited me in the long term because when, you know, folks weren't going to baseball games or Disney World or, you know, going out of the country for a vacation, 
they were doing more local things. So that August, man, things just turned on fire. But yes, I have seen, like when I first started guiding and I was only part-time, uh, you know, when we had the, when we had the financial, uh, uh, drop back in, was it 08? I mm -hmm. think that was my, it was like my first year. I'm like, I always say God has a sense of humor. I like, I have to start guiding on a year that we have, you know, the, financial issues. The worst so, problem in American it, history. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a really slow start for me. And, you know, I, there were questions like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this and, and, you know, make anything of it, you know, with the economy, the way it is. And, and I'm seeing it now because, uh, I just did a, um, I just did a TV program with Fox 27. It aired Thursday and it's going to run all the way through this weekend. It's called Outdoors Bound. And uh, the guy's name's George Noloff. And I talked to him about it and he said, absolutely. A lot of the guides he's talked to are having a lot of issues, you know, and, and he covers a pretty wide range, not just here, but, you know, down on the coast. Oh, wow. Uh, around Richmond for catfish, you know, uh, uh, saltwater. He said, absolutely. People are having impact. My webmaster, uh, he's out in Oregon. He said he, he thinks out there that some, some, you know, the, the guys that have been at it for a long time, he said, are going to be okay and survive. But he said some of the guys that may be just starting up, haven't been around, haven't gotten the recognition may not actually make it. So maybe the economy is a little worse out there than it is here. I don't know. Seemed a little severe based on what he was talking about. So we definitely see it. It does happen. Rob, I think you're going to be just fine though. Um, again, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about today. Please check out Rob, book a trip with him, help him out. Like and subscribe to the channel, guys, you know, please. And then the last thing, because I'm supposed to be pitching this more. Yeah. Huge shout out to Rob King. He's our Patreon supporter of the week. Remember, guys, is once we hit our Patreon goals, we're actually going to be able to start our nonprofit and actually help stop stocking some of our local rivers and stuff. So please check out our Patreon for our five year plan. And we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.